Okay. Well, good morning. And good morning. with all of that, remember Paul said, hey, at one point in time, bear with me a little bit in my folly. Uh, because he was seeing what was happening with people and where they were. And uh, he came to his own defense. Maybe nobody else was coming to his defense. And I'm not talking about any specific situations, just of what happens in our hearts if we let that happen. And as I said, you know, one of the main things I get out of Daniel chapter 1 is the fact that he purposed in his heart. And if we could take that scripture and just apply it with everybody and everything, we could walk through this life serving the Lord, uh, pleasing to God all the time, if we would. So uh, this morning, I just want to say in, in Isaiah 26 this morning, for a lot of folks out there, and maybe there's some new people listening in, uh, some of you that should be here in church, you should be here in church. As I was saying to our folks earlier here, you make it to a lot of these other events, and all of a sudden it's like, Church isn't a necessity in people's lives. That's scary. You know, when you talk about those guys, I mentioned this quite a long time ago, you go up in these big skyscrapers when they were building in New York and these different places, and they walk the beams and everything else. Uh, once they lost the fear of heights was when they died. Uh, when they got up there and uh, didn't pay attention to the wind velocity velocity way up there in the air, like, what, 27 stories or something like that. You pay attention to the fact that the wind is stronger and moving different up there than it does on the ground. You don't take all those things into consideration. Gosh, it can be deadly. And so uh, we were just talking about this at the, one of the places here where one of the guys said when they worked on those buildings, if they went to work that day and said, I don't know what it is, I just don't feel like I should go up there, they said, go home. They weren't going to put you at risk with any doubts or any feelings of negativity toward that type of thing. And Amen. of course, we're not run by our feelings, but we still have to pay attention to the fact that sometimes you know something's wrong. Amen. And you have to pay attention to that. And sometimes it's the leading of the Spirit of God if we believe that we really have the Spirit. So in all this, I just said yesterday, I said Wednesday night, do you really need something to pray about? Uh, do I need to point it out to you? Like, pray about? People being drawn to all kinds of things or being offended by all kinds of things. Uh, uh, they don't want to stand up against all kinds of things. And gee, we have to go through this again or we have to deal with that again and listen. This is the life of a believer in Christ. These men we read about in the Bible live this way every day, not knowing what was going to be before them when they got to a city or a town or whether they'd be accepted or rejected. I mean, Jesus went through the very same thing. Amen. Some accepted him, some rejected him. Such is life. So this morning, uh, Isaiah 26 if you think you need peace, you need perfect peace, right? Because we get a lot of this peace. Uh, these two young girls that played softball, I saw their interview, or three, excuse me, three girls, and they were being interviewed, and they were being asked why they continued, even though you might not have had such a good season, everything else. They talked about Jesus and the peace of God and everything else. It was great. Some of you saw that. I see you shaking your heads. Well, good. Um, yeah, and some people have been banned. Or when they spoke the name of Jesus, all of a sudden the videos are cut and different things like that, but these girls got it out there. Great to hear. It says, In that day shall this song be sung in the land of Judah. So you remember Israel was a divided kingdom. Israel and Judah, Judah in the south, Judah surrounding uh, Mount Moriah and so on, and Jerusalem. Uh, in that day, this song shall be sung in the land. We have a strong city. Salvation will God appoint for walls and bulwarks. So when you think about that, we talk about walled cities. You know, the kingdom, when it talks about New Jerusalem, there must be a wall because it says, without are these. All of us are safe and secure inside, but without, here's what's there. And it says, open ye the gates. 
that the righteous nation which keepeth the truth may enter in. So at this point in time, there's going to be a righteous people, according to what God says, that are going to be coming into the city. So he says, open the gates, the righteous nation, which keepeth the truth. Remember, there's a judgment in the end, and the Bible tells us that it's toward those who love not the truth. Because we're called to love the truth as Jesus is the truth and walk with him. Thou will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on the Lord, or stayed on thee, because he trusteth trusteth in thee. In the midst of all of this, you want this perfect peace he talks about, you got to keep your mind on Jesus. Keep your mind reeling in the things of God flooded with the things of God, embedded in the things of God, in the word of God, in the promises of God, that these are the things that are going to see me through. Things depress, things, you know, upset, things aggravate, but my mind is to be on the Lord. And even though I go through the same aggravations and hassles and torments and testings and trials and sometimes persecutions as anybody else if my mind is stayed on the Lord he says you'll have perfect peace he'll keep us in that the world is in an uproar upheavals everything's going awry but listen always remember this phrase from chaos order that's the intent of the global society That's the intent of the God of this world. He creates chaos, and somewhere along the line, they will say peace and safety. But he says sudden destruction will come. From chaos, order. We're creating the riots in the streets, and we'll come in and settle them. We're creating the overthrows in government and we'll come in and settle it. We're creating financial hardships for people. We'll come in and settle it. And then we'll go through Daniel 3. But he says, I will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. So listen, even though we see all these things, if we have the peace of God, we know that God told us all this, showed us all this, Let us know what's going to come to pass. Told us he'll provide for us, right? That he'll make a way for us. He'll see us through. He'll be with us in all these things. I don't know. Does that cause you to have peace? Well, thank you. (laughs) For the few folks here that said yes, the rest of you will come to comfort you in your day of trouble. (laughs) Or we'll call on the Lord for you. He says, open the gates, the righteous nation. I guess we got to be in the righteousness of Christ to have this peace. So what does that say about a lot of other folks? You're seeing people do, we prayed about yesterday, horrendous things. They have no peace. They're tormented. Uh, They're taking their own lives because they're tormented. They're not sure what they are because they're being tormented in their mind. There's no perfect peace. This is the will of the Lord that we walk in this perfect peace. If we're in perfect peace with God, I'm who you created me to be. I don't have to try to be somebody else or something else. I don't have to chase after all these things. You're with me. Amen. I will keep him, or thou will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee. In everything we look at. Do you have enough money? Do you have enough food? Is your family going to walk with the Lord? Are people going to turn around and repent? Or are we going to see all these things happen? Your mind stayed on the Lord. That's what it's all about. Being at perfect peace with God. He said in the world you're going to have tribulation, right? Amen. Who said that? Jesus did. So why would we expect any less? 
But in the midst of that, he said, even though you're going to have tribulation in the world, I'll keep your mind in perfect peace. What's the battleground? Where does the enemy attack? He attacks your mind. Uh, you know, I'm fearful of this. I really want that. I should have never done this. You know, they're going to come after me or whatever the case. All those things are in the mind. Whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. Listen, if we're really trusting in Jesus, we're going to show it by the way we act, by the way we live, by what we think on. If I sit and think on these things day and night, and listen, I get attacked with things just like anybody else. Hopefully some of these other guys you see on TV and everything will acknowledge and say, listen, I preach a good message or whatever, but I get bombarded with some of these things. I fight these things off unless they've ascended to a place where that doesn't happen anymore. And I don't know if that's possible. They might be able to tell you that. So it says, trust ye in the Lord forever. How long have you trusted in him now? Keep trusting in him. Amen. You've made it till today. Amen. Look at this. We're in 2023. We're halfway through the year and a little more. You've trusted him all this time in your life. Keep trusting him. Amen. Keep Amen. believing. Keep keeping your mind stayed upon him no matter what you're going through. Amen. And you may say nobody else is going through what I'm going through. Well, congratulations then. <laughs> and you're still making it. Amen. Think about that. Because we all do that in some area. And let, and let alone the fact that everybody else has gone through it ten times more than you have. You just don't know it because they don't show it. They, they walk in this. They keep their mind on the Lord. They trust in the Lord. They're believing. And they don't show what they've gone through. Trust ye in the Lord forever. For in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. Amen. Everlasting strength. You have days where you feel weak. He's still your strength. That's where you find you're not trusting in yourself. You're trusting in the Lord. I don't really want to do this. I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I want to face this. But Lord, you're my strength and my shield. You're the helmet of my salvation. You go through all those phraseologies. I can do all things in Christ which strengtheneth me. I, I uh, you know, David um, edified himself in the Lord. He reminded himself in the Lord, you brought me through the lion, you brought me through the bear. What is this Philistine that he should defy the, the armies of God, the, the armies of Israel, the people of God? Constantly reminding and speaking, uh, not trying to really convince yourself, but the word of God. Mind stayed on the Lord, trust Amen. in the Lord, trust in the Lord forever, in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. Do you know that's why a lot of the church is so weak? Pray for the church. If they're truly believers in Jesus, they're part of the church. They may err in things. They may fall by the wayside in things. They may enter into strange doctrine at times. But listen, Israel did that so many times. God had every right to cut them off. But he said, I'm still going to have a remnant. I'm still going to bring him in. I'm still going to prove myself in what I said. And he's going to do the very same thing in you and I if we just continue. But he's our strength. It's not our denomination. It's not our knowledge of the Bible. It's him. Because if I lose my mind tomorrow in a car accident, he's still my strength. Amen. I don't know how that works, but it's spiritual. Amen. It's not physical. It's not mental, though the battle is in the mind. Amen? Amen. Trust in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. So many people are weak in the flesh. They've never gone to the gym. They've never walked the miles. They've never run the stadium and, the, and so on. They've never lifted or worked out or whatever. They don't go do the exercise swim. They're weak in the flesh. And we would be weak in the Lord if we didn't trust that he was our strength. Trusting that he's our strength, we exercise ourselves in the things of God. Uh, like Jesus said, 
about arming ourselves like he did. Arm ourselves as he did. We're worried about guns sometimes. And yes, you're allowed to have protection and protect your family and everything else. Because always remember, in the Bible, there are two words under that word slew. I know I talked about this just a couple of weeks, two months or so ago. Moses slew the Egyptian. It doesn't imply in the Hebrew any iota of murder because he was defending his brother. But when Cain slew Abel, the terminology there includes murder. Amen. So when somebody accuses you of being a murderer because you're going to defend your house, that's false. That's the world saying, we don't want you to have this or some crazy thing. You have to know some of these things so that you know some of your rights because people are throwing things around out here. Is there a problem in the streets with guns? Amen. No. The problem in the street is the criminal and the criminal mind and the mind apart from God and the mind that says, I'm going to do as I will. Right. Like Satan said. Like, uh, what was it, Anton LaVey? Or no, it was uh, the other fellow, I can't think of his name all of a sudden, uh, who said, do as, do as thou wilt, was the supreme law of the Satanist movement. I can't think of his name, I picture his face. Crowley. Huh? Crowley. Yeah, Alistair Crowley. Uh, right? Alistair, yeah. yeah. Do as thou wilt. Amen. The satanic order. So, trust in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength, for he bringeth down them that dwell on high. Then he goes on to talk about some other things. But what he's implying here is, listen, we can all rest in the end. God is still going to do what he said. In the end, this supreme force that's going to dominate the world for a short period of time is going to come to naught. And I know there's a lot of Christianity right now that's saying that's never going to happen. There's never going to be a world order and this type of stuff. It's impossible. You need to read your Bible more. Amen. You need to look at what Daniel says here, and we'll go right there in a minute, uh, Daniel chapter 3, and, and follow again what goes on when the image is set up. And this refers to a time in Daniel, but it's a real good prelude to what the Bible tells us in Revelation 13 about the man who uh, builds the, the idol of the beast and says bow down and worship it and gives power to the beast and power to speak to the image. Listen, look what's happening. We're looking at all this robotics. There's all kinds of this stuff right now. Images that are speaking. What does that tell you? It means Nothing is impossible in these realms. You got the first transgender, transgender having a baby. And then you got to try to figure out, well, is it a man having a baby as a woman? Or is it a woman who changed to a man who's having a baby? What in the world's going on here? It's like you got to look at everything and you got to have an imagination. I know that. <clears throat> So then in Philippians, I don't think I gave the, you this for the board back there, but Ephesians, or excuse me, Philippians chapter 4, 4 through 7, you might think I'm going to read 8, where it says finally to think on these things, but I want to read 4 through 7, because as we go through Daniel and talk about this time that's coming in Revelation, uh, which again, Daniel looks like a prelude to, it says in verse 4 of chapter 4 of Philippians, Rejoice in the Lord always, for always. And again, I say rejoice. Amen. You know, if you can rejoice in no matter what's going on, it doesn't mean you're rejoicing about the problem, but you're rejoicing that in the problem, God's still working. In the problem, he hasn't left us. In the problem, he may allow you to see some things that are going to be such a benefit down, down the road to you and such a strength to you because him in him, as it says there, is everlasting strength. And it may be a thing that you say, I don't know if I can make it through. But once you go through, you say, here's another thing he brought me through that. 
I can deal with this. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. Wouldn't it be great if people came up to you and said, you know, I just really noticed you, you don't get rattled. You don't get shaken. You're not always complaining about what's going on. You're not, um, and, and I, get, I get this thing of, well, you don't have any faith. No, I, I know what the word says. Not that I'm a great scholar, but if it tells me there's going to be problems like this, why would I act like there won't be problems like that? Amen. Why would I pray, God, don't let problems like that come on the earth? He already said they're going to flood the earth with it. Yeah. He said the man of sin is going to come in the future. Why would I pray that the man of sin never comes? Because now I'm praying against the will of God. Will it come to pass? Amen. Yeah. No. I mean, what I'm praying won't oh, come to pass because right. I'm not Amen. praying according to his will. <clears throat> now, listen, that upsets a lot of people, and I don't mean to say that in a wise or smart way, but we can't pray against the will of God. Amen. So he says, uh, rejoice in the Lord always. Let your, in verse 5, let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. The Lord is closer to coming now than he was when we first believed, right? He says that in the scripture. 2,000 years ago, he started all this process. We're at the winding it all up now. We're at the place of these things are manifesting right in front of us. We can see him. We got to have strong faith. But he's the one that gives us faith, right? He gives to every man the measure of faith. He gives it to us. The Lord is at hand. Remember Jesus said the kingdom is at hand? At hand means it's like I can reach it. The Lord is this close. Then he tells us the word is nigh thee. It's even in thy mouth. In the scripture. He says be careful for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. So, let your moderation be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Prayer and supplication. Be careful for nothing. Be anxious for nothing. Uh, don't get overexcited in anything. Remember when we read about um, in Daniel chapter 2 how Nebuchadnezzar, the king, had made this great proclamation, proclamation of Daniel and Daniel's God. And then in verse 1 of chapter 3, Nebuchadnezzar went and built the gold image, right? 90 feet tall, 9 feet wide, he built the image. Is it because he looked at what Daniel prophesied, what God brought forth, that he, Nebuchadnezzar, was the head of gold and the great power? And when Daniel spoke this to him, he said, you are the king of kings, basically, with small k's, not king of kings like the Lord Jesus. Did it go to his head? Did he take it too far? Uh, so we pray and we ask the Lord and we ask him to keep us in. And a lot of times somebody may give you a word of prophecy, which in reality is a word of knowledge because we're not prophesying new things, but we get words of knowledge, as the Bible says in Corinthians there, about what he intends and what he's doing. And so it may be for a time and season that God really did speak in that, but you jump out there now. It's like you're in a plane up in the air, and the fellow tells you, now listen, when you get down to the ground, you're going to be so close, you're going to see the target, you're going to be able to direct yourself right to the target. Sounds okay, right? How many of you ever jump out of a plane? <laughs> we, we, again, we, I mentioned Randy Stephen about, Stevens about boxing, and he was also a paratrooper in the Army, uh, and I know some have. Anyway, so you're so excited. Why, they told me I'm going to hit the mark. 
So you jump out of the plane. And there you go. But wait a minute, we didn't give you the parachute yet. But you told me I'm going to hit the mark. Well, you are. But we don't think you're going to be here to talk about it. If you do hit the mark, you have to wait to get the parachute on, right? And you should have some instruction. Amen. And you should know what you're going to be facing when you jump out of the plane. But a lot of times that's overlooked. So Nebuchadnezzar, is that what went on here? Well, I'm the head of gold. You described me. Your God said I'm the king of kings. And who wouldn't want to hear that? Amen. So I know what I'll do. Well, I'll, I'll build myself a statue. We don't know if it looked like him or not. It doesn't really imply that or say that. But he built a statue. Maybe I shouldn't jump into that yet. Let's go back here. Let's finish reading. Be careful for nothing. It means be anxious for nothing. Don't jump out of the plane until you're ready. Or let's just say you're flying in the plane. You land. You get, you're ready to get out. You got your, uh, your bag out of the overhead and so on. You're getting ready to run out the door. The door opens up. You run out the door. But wait a minute. They didn't bring the steps up yet. It's a pretty good fall. About 14 feet out of one of those planes. You smash into the ground. Be anxious, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication. And listen, just because somebody said it and somebody said it's God, you better pray about it. Because they may be mistaken. And they may be like that prophet when we read back there in the scripture who lied. You remember that? We did that just a couple months ago. He lied to the other man of God and said, God told me that you should come into my house and eat bread with me. And the man died because of that. Be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Hey, Lord, if this is you, I thank you for it. I thank you you'll bring it to pass. <laughs> but I'm praying about it. I'm not jumping right into it. Uh, a while back, somebody told me I should be a politician. Of course, I remember somebody a long time ago told me that I'm too honest, so I wouldn't make a good politician. <laughs> so what will I choose? I'll choose to be too honest and not be a good politician. Amen. Be careful for nothing in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God. You know, and I'll just say this again in case any of you forgot it or thought I jumped into this. When I was asked to take this position... I asked for time to pray about it. I didn't say yes at the meeting and so on in front of everybody. I said, let me pray about it and make sure it's the Lord. But I already knew God had told me some things and some other things came along in that. And so when that came up, I said, well, Lord, if this is you, I will for sure. I mean, in your family, let me put it this way. When your parents passed, and if some of them are still alive, if they do pass, would you rather have some neighbor or some guy down the road or somebody from the state come in and run your family from that point on? Or would you rather have somebody that grew up with you, like you never really liked your older brother, but suddenly he's going to be in charge, so listen, I should just get along with him. Wouldn't that be quite a bit better? No? Yeah. No? No? Am I looking at a no, a yes, or? Yes. yes. Okay. If your husband passed away, would you rather have your father come in and help you out or some guy from Timbuktu that doesn't know squat about you? Yeah. Yeah, that, that so I looked at it as, well, that's what we always talk about. Why can't people be raised up in the ministry to fulfill the positions? That's what we were taught Amen. from back in the 70s when I came to the Lord. Amen. Of course, a lot of that stuff's being thrown off to the wayside now. We didn't look for the youngest guy to be the pastor. Because the youngest guy in all reality, first, if he hasn't raised anything, any of a family, he doesn't know what that's about. Amen. He doesn't know what a lot of the people in the ministry are going through, raising kids and busy about this and that and troubles and sickness. He hasn't dealt with a lot of people in their problems and situations. He may have an education from a book. But to have de dealt with things, it's like how many people say to me, well, you haven't been in drugs, so you don't know what I'm going through. 
gosh, do I really have to put myself in that to be able to talk to you about what Jesus can do in your life if you let him? Amen. Your drug addiction is no different than everybody else's addiction to porn and lust and gambling and everything else or just love in the world. It all comes under sin, right? Amen. And I understand that the drug addiction, like alcohol addictions and so on, they get a hold of the physical parts of the body and sometimes of the mind and the soul. But Jesus came to free us from all of that. So when you understand that, it doesn't mean you have to have been there. But of course, somebody who can say, I was there, I understand. Yes, that can be a little more powerful. Jesus never did a drug in his life. Jesus was never an alcoholic. Jesus wasn't an adulterer or a fornicator, Amen. but he set all of them free, didn't he? Amen. He was never lame, but he raised the lame man. He was never blind, but he healed the eyes of the blind who were blind from birth, which never is recorded in history. Right? Amen. So who do we trust? So be careful for nothing, anxious for nothing. Don't jump into anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, and don't let all the no noise out here. I know a lot of stuff, and I, I shared something yesterday, and then all of a sudden the media is <coughs> getting pummeled with, that's not fact, that's not this. I said, so we'll watch and see. It may not be fact then, but it was on a re very, replica, uh, very respectable or re reputable Amen. news broadcast. Amen. So I figured it's got to be real, right? I mean, there really was never a laptop or any of that kind of stuff. The Russians were involved in everything. I mean, the Russians must be involved in where, what's going on in seminaries with theology and everything else. Are you all familiar with what I'm talking about? Yeah. Okay, just checking. Be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. We talked about crying out to God on Wednesday night, crying out to God in our Saturday prayer meetings. Still, still, people, gosh, when are you going to see? Yes, it's beautiful out there. The lake, the shores are beautiful. The beach is beautiful. Boating's beautiful. Golf on Sunday morning's beautiful. All these things are wonderful and fantastic. But there's a day coming. We read about that in that day. There's a lot of things the scripture says in that day, in that time, as things approach, we see them approaching. Who's getting stirred up more and more? Somebody says, well, we've gone through all this before. I'm not telling you Jesus is coming. I'm telling you the day of evil is coming. Amen. I'm not telling you that, hey, in uh, 1988, we're going to be raptured out. You're never going to have to go through anything. I'm telling you, you better be prepared for what this Bible says is coming on the land. You're not going to face the wrath of God. You ought to rejoice. That's something to rejoice in the Lord always. And again, rejoice. I'm not going to suffer under the wrath of God. But in the world, I'll have tribulation. But I can have my mind at perfect peace because my mind is stayed on the Lord because I trust in the Lord. Verse 7 says, if you do these things, the peace of God, which passes understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds, your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. Do you all remember what the word commitment means? Anybody here married to anybody? Is that a commitment? Amen. Did you ever have a fight? No, don't say that in church. <laughs> Because that would mean you're not good Christians. Oh, Lord. Well, what? You argued? You raised your voice? You threw something? I know you're a queen and he's a king. And this is your castle. And he stays in his chambers and you stay in yours. And according to a lot of people, you have to ask permission to approach him. Right? Because that's what kings and queens do. Uh, that's a fairy tale. I mean, it's the old days of that, but the fairy tale is we've never had an argument. Well, and if that's really true, you're very blessed. That's nice. But the rest of us, we're still working to get in heaven. Amen? Amen. Amen. 
Uh, anybody got scars on your tongue? Your lip? From biting your tongue? From chewing on your lip? She ain't going to listen anyway. He's always going to do the same thing. That's him. Well, you married him that way, and you married her that way. Pray. Rejoice in the Lord always. And tell him, you know, I'm being very moderate today about what you're doing and how you're acting. And you can say the same thing to her. This is my moderation toward you. I'm not going to argue back with you. I'm not going to frown. I'm not going to walk away. I'm just going to stand here, and I'm going to tell you how much I love you. That's why we made this commitment and got married. That's good advice. That's a counseling session right there. And the peace of God which passes all understanding. Listen, some of you lost loved ones. People said to you, I don't know how you're doing this, but it's like I know you're sad and so on. You miss them. Uh, you know, let me, let me jump to something here. Uh, I think it's John. I hope I gave this to you guys, but John chapter 14, since I said that. Because Jesus, I was going to end with this, and I still will at the end, but Jesus said in John 14, 27, and 28, Peace I leave with you. Remember, he's going to depart. My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You have heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. If you loved me, you would rejoice because I said I go to the Father. And I, I sat there and I thought, Lord, if anything would happen to my wife, I hope I can say that because she's gone away, I know she's gone to be with the Lord, I should rejoice. Amen. I tried to do that when my own mother passed away. Yeah. I mean, she lived to 86 years old. She was ready. She knew she was going home to be with the Lord. Said to me, I'll see you again, but... You know, I wanted to see you before I go. I remember all that very clearly. But in my love for her, I understand she's better. And she's going to be with the Father, with Jesus, just like Jesus is saying, you would rejoice because I'm going to be with my Father. And so in all this, even though there was sorrow, I had tears like anybody else at times. Other times I'd laugh about something that went on or said whatever. But the rejoicing is you're with the Lord. Do we really believe this? Because it Amen. makes it so much better and easier to go through these things. And in that you'll have perfect peace, as the Bible says. I hope you're getting something out of this. Amen. Be careful for nothing. In verse 7, And the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Then in verse 8, of course, we go into, he says, what to think on. And then verse 9, he tells us, the things that you've both seen and heard, or let me, put, let me read it, those things which you have learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. I, I hate to keep button heads with this Christian yoga stuff, Christian meditation, Christian contemplative prayer where we empty our minds. Uh, yoga is Hinduism. There, there's these things of identifying your personality and character. They come from false cultish origins. It's called enneagrams. You look at this stuff, I'm this type of character, and the world's using it. Why would you be surprised that the world wants to put a label on you? Why would you be surprised that King Nebuchadnezzar would want to take Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and change their names to something else and put a title, a cloak on them of a false god? in their kingdoms. Why, in America, it was for the longest time people had what we call biblical or Christian names. 
because we were a biblical Christian, Judeo-Christian country Amen. founded on the principles of the gospel. Whether those guys were right or wrong or heathens or anything else, the scripture still has power. I go in some churches sometimes and did this way back in the beginning when I first got saved because my wife wasn't saved. And I would sit there. The scripture they read still has power. It doesn't give them any favor. Just like if a man is reading and whatever, Moses sinned in what he did with the rock, but the people got water. So he says, learn the things you've learned of me, right? The things in verse 9 of chapter 4 of Philippians, the things you've learned of me, you've received of me, you've heard of me, and seen in me. Do these things. What did they learn? They learned the gospel of Jesus Christ. What did they hear? They heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. What did they receive? The gospel. I've delivered the gospel unto you. That which I've received, I've delivered unto you. Paul said numerous times, those things and the God of peace shall be with you. And listen, I know that doesn't concern too many of you in here. Those of you out there listening, all these nice phraseologies you post on Facebook and Instagram and all these things, when you see the, the uh, logo there, you need to go search and see where that came from. When you see the guy's name down there at the bottom, you need to go see what that guy was because you're putting a post out there that is coming from a cultish background. Mysticism and witchcraft and new age and all these other things. And we're not to have anything to do with that. That's why a lot of this stuff, when we talk about the holidays, we need to pay very close attention to. How does it line up with biblical holy days? Amen. And what's been thrown in there? Well, just because it's nice. Anyway, let me stop with that. Do these things, he said, and the God of peace shall be with you. Let's go to Daniel chapter 3. We'll deal with Daniel a little bit and what went on here. So let me remind you this again, because as we look at Daniel 3, chapter 1, or verse 1, remember that the king had just finished praising Daniel. In fact, it said he bowed down to Daniel. And listen. What we see here is numerous times the king is like a roller coaster. He's hostile. He's going to kill all the wise men. He's going to kill all the seers and, uh, you know, the astronomers and everybody else because they can't come up with an answer. He wants it done right now. Suddenly he gets an answer to what he wanted. Uh, Daniel comes in with the interpretation in the dream. Says he even bowed down and worshipped Daniel. There's people that will do that with you if you tell them what they want to hear or tell them they're wonderful. And that's, again, like I said Wednesday night or Sunday, about smooth words like butter. But it says war is in their hearts. So is King Nebuchadnezzar now a believer in the Lord because he had a word spoken to him? Absolutely not. Because here... Verse uh, 1 of chapter 3, Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was, was three score cubits, 90 feet, and the breadth thereof six cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Now remember, this is not saying the city of Babylon, but the province went down south further. And then we will see about the, the Chaldeans. You remember uh, Abraham, whose father they dwelt in the land of the Chaldeans, in Ur of the Chaldees, which was down in the southern province there of the Babylonian uh, Empire lands. And so remember, they were idol makers and worshipers. And Abraham was called out of that to go to the promised land, right, to Canaan. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold. Remember, the head was gold. Daniel said to him, thou art the head of gold, thou art the king of kings and, you know, the ruler of empires and so on. So he set up that uh, 
statue in the province, in the plain of Dura, in the province of Babylon. Then Nebuchadnezzar, the king, sent to gather together. Now listen to this closely. He gathers together the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Now, in this, there's some of these terminologies as he named the different positions that there's different languages here that these terminologies come from because they spoke the different languages. So some people have combated that, that this is no way Daniel could have had this, but they spoke different languages. So he calls all the leaders. You could say he called a G7 summit or a, the G20 or whatever, calling the world leaders because that's what we see in the future, right? A lot of this, if we look ahead to what we read in the book of Revelation, we see that the leaders, the kings of the earth and some of these things are going to be gathered together to do what? Let's read. Then the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces were gathered together unto the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So he summoned them all, and then we read, they all came. And now they're standing before the image. How many of you saw at one of the festivities over there? Must have been in the northern European, Scandinavian area somewhere. They had this, the games, I think it was, and they brought out the huge bull and then the people were dancing in front of the bull and then they brought out crystals and the bull was mad and angry. It was blowing out smoke and when they held up the crystals, none of you saw that? It was in the national news. That's okay. Anyway, this bull must have been at least up to the back part of our sanctuary, which is probably about 30 feet in height. And there's a woman riding up there. Anyway, these other people are dancing around and they're partying and so on, just like it says in the scripture and whatnot. And then they pulled out these crystals, crystals and the crystals had a calming effect on the bull, which is all soul power. But is that the kind of thing that a lot of people are trying to do now with things? I've talked to you about some of the things they said were impossible, but there was a point in time, it says, and there's lots of articles about this, that our own government used uh, radio waves to calm a religious sect down and to cause them not to war against what was going on. And they said it worked. So there's articles. You can read it all over the place. I could give you more direct terminology. You can type it in and read the articles. Um, so all of these came together, and now they're before the image. And then we talk about the image in Revelation, uh, what it talks about, which we'll jump to here in just a minute. The herald cried aloud in verse 4, To you it is commanded, O people, nations, and languages, that at what time you hear the sound of the coronet, the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, the psaltery, the dulcimer, and all kinds of music, you fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar, the king, has set up. Now, you see all those instruments, right? And those are all real instruments, but then it says, and the music. And so what you see today is a lot of people are very leery about a lot of the music things that are going on because of scriptures like this, and with good reason because they actually believe that music is going to be used to get people to bow down. Is there power in music? Yes. What calmed the satanic spirit that was working in Saul? David played in front of him, right? Amen. It didn't deliver Saul from the spirit, but it calmed the evil spirit down. Because what happened later? Saul went out to kill David. He had hatred and murder in his heart, 
right? And Amen. in the end, he was the one that ended up dying. So, to you it's commanded. Um, all the nations and so on and so on and the music that you fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up and whoso falleth not down and worship worship it the same shall or shall the same hour be cast in the midst of a burning fiery furnace and of course when we go into revelation and read i guess let's see in revelation 13 verse 14 through 16 talks about him who's going to deceive men on the earth by the means of using miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast saying to them that dwell in the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had <clears throat> the wound by a sword remember he was going to die and come to life which had the wound by a sword and did live and he had power to give life unto the image of the beast. Now there's all kinds of ideas about some of this. We understand that. But to have read the word, what's the Bible say? If we read the revelation, we'll, we'll be blessed, right? Isn't that what it says? Yeah. So to read these, even though we may not understand and comprehend, because having this word in you will be a discerner when things begin to appear or show up. Why are people concerned about music? Well, if you don't read this, you'd say, well, why are they so worried about that the song might not really be scriptural or have? Because Jesus, when he was in the Mount of Olives, it says that they sang psalms. They sang scriptural psalms. And so when we are making up all kinds of songs and we have some feelings towards something, we put our feelings in there. We may be feeling pretty lenient today about everybody and where they're at. And so we put our leniency in there. And it sounds wonderful and it goes great with the tune. Uh, there's a one, one uh, key, I think it is, or a chord, I forget how you say it, which one it is. But in music, they tell you that this has an emotional effect on, on people. And if you just play in these certain chords, you can move people. Anyway, there's a young man that was on one of these talent shows and they said he's singing in that heavenly chord that moves people. I went, oh my gosh. Now, the average person would go, oh, that's nice. But I know there's something to, to that. It means something. And most of you, I'm sure you probably would too, if you heard it and, and understood. So uh, he gives power to do in the sight uh, the miracles in the sight of the beast saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image what did they do in Moses' time they made an image right Amen. Aaron loved it he was down there with them this is what they want this is what we'll do Moses come down what in the world are you doing God said I don't hear the sound of war it's a party going on hey let's party they made an image but this had power in verse 15 to give life unto the image of the beast that the image should both speak and where did I go here and cause that as many as would not worship the image maybe if I straighten that up I could read it worship the image of the beast should be killed so somebody gives power to this image to speak how many of you remember there was a uh, evangelist ministry that we were involved with and uh, one day as they were getting older, which this is only about 18 years ago, I think that's a long time to some people. <laughs> he started doing holograms of his ministry because he said, after I'm dead and gone, they can put this on and the hologram of me can do teaching even though I'm no longer here. And we sat there and went, ugh, that sounds scary. That was in the early stages. And they worked on it and they did it. They're not using it though. 
And I think because of what things like this imply in the scriptures. But they could actually do holograms. So he's standing there and it doesn't have to be something he talked. They could put anything in his mouth and it would go with it. That's scary. Amen. Now you look at YouTube, you got to pay attention and some of these uh, rumble and different ones because there's what's called deep fake videos and they can make anything be said looks like it's you and it's not. I've talked about this a little bit. So we're looking at somebody that there's an image of the beast who was slain, who's now alive again by that image. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast. So we talk about a hologram. We talk about, you know, uh, Dr. Spock and Beam Me Up, Scotty, and, you know, all that type of stuff. The early days of what we saw. Nobody ever thought you'd be wearing a computer wrist watch, but we saw that in a cartoon 35 years ago. I'm surprised we don't have a phone that's a shoe, but we don't need that because you got it in the watch. You got it in a little earbud and the whole thing. You don't need any of this stuff. Amen. We need to pay attention to all this. And again, he will keep thee in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on him. <clears throat> so the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causes all both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond to receive a mark in their right hand or on their forehead, in their forehead. And uh, as it's implied there in the Middle East, that word mark can mean a badge. Uh, it could mean like a bandana, like we've seen in some of the uh, terrorist things uh, that has their God's phrase on there. And so we, we understand where all these things can come to pass now, things that we've never seen before. And then in Revelation 14, 8 through 10, it talks about worshiping the beast and the image uh, in the same way. Now, here, if you don't worship the beast and the image, you get what Nebuchadnezzar said. He was going to throw you in the fiery furnace. Here, you're going to be slain. But what the Bible tells us is if you do worship the image of the beast, in the end, it says, you're going to suffer the wrath of God and torment. Now, what would be better to suffer uh, being killed or suffer the wrath of God and eternal torment? Being killed? Yeah. You're all supposed to say yes, yes, because your Christianity isn't just you go to work and you talk to somebody when you get the opportunity Amen. and so on. So... Um, with that, let's go back to Nebuchadnezzar, because what Nebuchadnezzar is going to acknowledge here is the difference between being thrown in the fire or being slain or suffering under the torment of God, in case I forget to uh, put it that way. So <clears throat> back to uh, Daniel chapter 3. Verse 6 said, you risk being thrown in the fire. Therefore, in verse 7, at that time, when all the people heard the sound of the coronet, the flute, the harp, the salt, or sackbut, the psaltery, and all kinds of music, all the people, the nations, the languages, fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. A lot of times you wonder why people follow things and can't see what's going on. Pay attention. That's why. Wherefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came near and accused the Jews. Now listen, Chaldeans, they were from down in the southern Babylonian empire there. The Chaldeans were like a warring people. They were fighters and, fighters and so on. But then they became known as the intellectuals. And later you can read in history where the Chaldeans are the ones who kept track of the astronomy, the stars and everything. For 360 years, they wrote it all down. Be like every day, every hour or so, you write down the position of the stars for 360 years. And they believe that that's why when the star of Bethlehem appeared, that the Magi were able to know to follow it because all these things had been recorded. And they were looked at 
as the intellects or the intellectuals of their time. And so what happens? At that time, certain of those intellectuals who were for, formerly the warriors came near and accused the Jews. They spake and said unto the king Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. Now, how did the intellectuals speak? They're very precise. They're very respectful of your position and so on. And so they beautified the king, just like anybody else who would walk in the presence of the king. They spake and said unto King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. Thou, O king, hast made a decree. Remember, they are scribes also as intellects. They go on to repeat that uh, if any man hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sack, but the psaltery, the dulcimer, and all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. Whosoever falleth not and worshipeth, that he should be cast in the midst of a burning fire. There are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. Uh, these men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods. I pray that that can be said of all of us one day. And that's about this intermingling. And that's Amen. why we have to try to warn people like, listen, you're looking like you're on the verge of being a part of all this stuff. He says, we're not to serve their gods. Uh, they have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Listen, there's a lot of images being set up right now. They're not gold necessarily. But if you want to be a part of this society, this is what you have to do. This is how you have to live. It's called peer pressure. In every form you want to take it. So they refused. They regarded not. They served not thy gods. They worshiped. Uh, not the golden image which thou hast set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage and fury, here he goes again, the true inner man comes out, commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. Uh, then they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar, in verse 14, spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego? Do not ye serve my gods? Wait a minute. A while ago, he was praising Daniel for his God, right? Don't you serve my God nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now, if you be ready, I'm giving you another chance. You know, I like you guys. When Daniel said I should appoint you, I did. But now I'm going to give you another chance. Now, if you be ready, that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, the psaltery, the dulcimer, and all kinds of music, you fall down and worship the image which I have made, well, it'll be okay. But if you worship not, you shall be cast the same hour in the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Wait a minute. You are just praising Daniel and his God, the God who delivered. This is double-mindedness double or hypocrisy to the extreme. Amen. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said unto the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. Hey, it's not going to take time for me to tell you what I'm going to do. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. And if he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king, and he will deliver us out of thy hand, O king, but if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Remember Daniel set his heart not to defile himself? Remember, Daniel brought forth the truth. He kind of said, I hate to tell you this, but this is what God's showing you. They said, if it be so, uh, our God whom we serve, he's able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. He'll deliver us out of your hand. If not, 
Didn't take him long to say, we will not serve your gods, thy gods, nor worship the golden image. Listen, there's going to be days in the lives of the true believers, they're going to have to say, I'm sorry, I will not be a part of that. I told you all that we're here yesterday at prayer. I repeated it again. I said, I'm sorry. If that's what you're going to do, I'm not going there. I'm sorry. If I don't feel right before the Lord about doing some things, nobody's going to talk me into it. I pray that I keep that. If I'm wrong, I'll answer for it. I hope I don't hurt nobody in the process, but I hope I'm right. Amen? But when you're looking at the scripture, reading the scripture, saying, I'm sorry, I don't see that in the scripture. You're creating an image here. You're putting something up in front of the people, and it doesn't have to be a statue made of gold. It can be a philosophy, an ideology, a unity program. Well, we're going to let them in. We know what they're doing. We know it's totally wrong, but we're going to let them in because we want to be in showing the world that we're in unity. I shared with some of you about having a conversation with somebody where I said, well, listen, I don't think we can join this group to that group because this group is serving the Lord and this group is what the Bible says an abomination to the Lord. Amen. Can't put it together. Amen. And I feel for those that are in abomination. They don't know it or understand it. We know it, we understand it. We're to try to help them to see their way out. Then Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury, and the form of his visage was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. His visage was changed. It means his facial expression, how he looked at them, changed. What do you mean? You're not going to go along with us? You're not going to do what we're asking anymore? You're not going to follow my lead? No, your lead has no biblical sustenance whatsoever. I will not follow your lead. Sometimes we have to be there. Mm -hmm. So Nebuchadnezzar, in other words, we could say, you know what I always say about this, right? Everybody loves you till you say no. They said no to the king. And the king's fury rages. How dare you? Don't you know I can have your head? I can throw you in the fiery furnace, all those things. So he's in fury. Therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace one seven times more than it was wont to be heated. In other words, he's furious, hurry up and fire that thing up, do whatever you got to do, make it rage seven times what we normally do. When I was in those uh, steel containers down there at Republic Steel, uh, was sometimes they were still 300 and some degrees, I think, on the inside. We had to go in there, we had to wear coats. We were only allowed to, uh, wool coats and pants and so on, helmet and the ear flaps and all that stuff. Uh, because, and we were only allowed in there for 20 minutes, that's 300 degrees. You couldn't burn anything in there, except if you were baking a pie. Um, <laughs> one of those peach, whatever they were, pies. Uh, you couldn't burn anything in there. This fire is burnable, and now he's going to stoke it seven times because he's hot, he's mad. He should have just went over and looked at him and burned him with his eyes because he's on fire. So the, the furnace seven times uh, to, than, than it's supposed to be heated, and he commanded the most mighty men that were in the, his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. These men, or then these men, were bound in their coats, that's the boys, their hosen, uh, their hats, and their other garments, and were cast into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. When I see those garments represented there, it talks about them wearing a turban, so on and so forth. The king wanted to get rid of everything about them. Think about that. And they were going to be thrown in the fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's commandment was so quick and so urgent, 
uh, and the furnace so exceeding hot, the flame of the fire slew those men which took Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Remember, those were the mighty men, his mighty men, some of his main warriors and fighters. He killed them in the process, his own men. He was so angry at these guys. Verse 23 says, And these three men, excuse me, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, fell down, bound into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Then Nebuchadnezzar, the king, was astonished. So they're thrown in the fire. The king's astonished. He rose up in haste and shouted, said, spake, and this unto his counselors, did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, True, O king. He answered and said, Now listen, they're standing back from the fire. He sounds like he's running the risk of getting burned himself because he wants to make sure they're fried. Coats, tunics, knickers, whatever, everything. <clears throat> he answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Some versions it says the Son of Man. In actuality, the terminology means a deity. It could be an angel, could be many say Christ, it could be any of these. Uh, there's not actually a determination of that, but there is a scripture uh, which is in, uh, let's see, I know I put this down, Isaiah 63. It talks about when the Jews were crying out in their affliction, and it says, in all their affliction, the Lord who was observing was afflicted, and the angel of his presence saved them. So either an angel, the presence of God in the form of an angel, Christ himself was there in the midst, one of those, it's not really for sure. But he said, I see one who is the form of the Son of Man. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spake and said, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, ye servants of the Most High God. Does he remember Daniel now? Because for a while there he had no remembrance of that whatsoever. <clears throat> ye servants of the Most High God. Come forth and come hither. Now listen. They're in there waiting. They can't come out. They might slew, uh, slay them when they come out or kill them, whatever. But he calls them out, and so they're in there, and they just now, says they came forth. And the princes, the governors, the captains, and the king's counselors being gathered together saw the men. So now... Remember, this is a joint effort. They wanted these men put to death. They didn't follow suit with what was being done. Now, again, I'm going to say we're not to be rebels. We're not to be like the thing that's being portrayed nowadays. Jesus was a re rebel, and he rebelled against all this and rebelled against all that. No, we're to keep covenant with God. We're to keep the right ways of the Lord. We're to know that we should obey God rather than men. In other words, when the laws that men pass defy the law of God, then we be like uh, back there with Esther, uh, when you know the king passed by, the rulers and so on, and you're all to bow down, and her uncle didn't bow down. We're to be like these men where we're not gonna bow down to these things that you put up in front of everybody, that we see that are being held as some kind of a salvation or a way. Now, in this, I want you to understand something that I read was pretty important and intelligent uh, and I believe uh, very biblical. It doesn't really imply that they're doing this as a God worship, but the idol represented your allegiance to Nebuchadnezzar. It would be like I've said so many times here in America, Listen, don't worship America. 
America's going to fall like the rest of the nations. The Bible says in the end, they will all be against Israel. God's going to be against all of the nations. But in reality, there was such a closeness here of worshiping this golden image that it is in homage to Nebuchadnezzar and sort of like worshiping a false god. And we've got to be very sure that we don't entangle ourselves in the same thing. If America is done away with tomorrow, if the party wins and we have no borders whatsoever, if they have all the attorney generals and the states dissolved, we are still people who are to serve the Lord in the midst of whatever is left here. You understand that? And if you think that's not part of the plan, that's part of the plan. Because you can't have global governance while you have autonomous nations Amen. and powers and so on. Uh, the enemy wanted to tear down the walls around the cities so that they could get in, just like we see now with nations and everything else. Does that all make sense? Amen, yes. So the angel of his presence, or an angel, or the Lord Jesus, somebody was there in the fire. Uh, we, we went on how the king called them out of the fire. Uh, 27, the princes and all them came together. The men came out. They saw that they weren't changed whatsoever. They weren't singed the hair on their heads, their bodies had no fire or, or smell or anything on them. Uh, all of that was no, null and void to them. Verse 28, Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God. Now he's back on the high part, point of the roller coaster roast, ro ride. <laughs> My mouth was very dry this morning and it's still fighting me here. But I'm winning. Amen. Yeah. So Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, who hath sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him. Now listen to what he says. Trusted in him. Trusted in the Lord, right? Mm -hmm. I will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on the Lord, for he trusteth in him. Their God sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him, has changed the king's words. In other words, the interpretation there is frustrated what I said, messed me up. I decreed this, said this is what was going to happen, but their God and the angel of his presence messed all that up. Change the king's words. And again, he says, and they, basically, they yielded their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Daniel purposed in his heart not to defile himself. These men set in their heart that they weren't going to worship any other god. They weren't going to be dragged into that for favor and so on. Amen. But look at what he says. They yielded up their bodies. What he's saying is they were willing to give their bodies physically in service to their god. Amen. In other words, die in the flesh to keep covenant with God. What does he command us to do? And what is it, Romans 12? Present your bodies a living sacrifice. sacrifice. Amen. Is your heart committed to that? Are you of the mindset, whatever I have to do? Lord, even though I think it's way over my pay grade or way beyond what I committed to, if it's your will, Lord, are we of that mindset? Are we always finding a reason out or a way out, an excuse in everything? And you may say, am I saying this to you? No, I'm saying it to all of us. 
Amen. Yes, concerts are nice. Fellowships are nice. But what if God calls us to work in the field? Amen. That's right. Like, you know, out there at the uh, safety day thing. And again, we do these other things. And this is very minor, minor stuff. Amen. Some people are working at the expense of their lives to share the gospel. And we go do these things. Listen, it's an opportunity for somebody to say, I'm going to go share my faith. I'm going to go labor in the field. I'm going to go work in the harvest. We don't know what's going to become of all these things. I can only point at that to say, where were you? Where are you? I can only point at prayer and say on Saturday mornings, why aren't you there? And I know you might get angry. We've had people come in here and preach these hard messages and everybody ran to the altar and the pastor had said the same thing for a solid year and nobody moved a muscle. <laughs> nobody said, I'm going to change my way. I'm going to get more committed, more dedicated. I'm going to avail myself, whatever. Some people have said they are. Watch and see how blessed they are. And people will say, well, you know, that's them. Yeah, well, what about when we do these things? He's acknowledging they were ready to give up their bodies in service to the Lord. Amen. Change the king's words. They frustrated what he said. You know what? Uh, <clears throat> somebody tells you if you go out there and do this, and you know what I've shared with you before? Somebody told me they're going to kill me. Didn't stop me. I mean, I've got to do what I'm going to do. Somebody tells you if you go outside, you can get sick. Or we went through that with this pandemic thing. If you get around this, you've got to be wise. You're, we're not Amen. foolish. We're not tempting God. Amen. We're not going to run to throw ourselves in the fire and say, God will take care of me. No, these guys didn't throw themselves in. They were thrown in, and God proved himself. So they gave, they were willing to yield up their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any God except their own God. And you might sit here today and say, well, what's that got to do with me? I'm not going to worship any other God. Uh, you don't know that yet. Amen. I always used to talk about this. The guy who on an Israel trip in front of everybody, he took his coat and he went like this and threw it on his shoulders and he was parading around and said, I'm going to be faithful to Israel all my life and nothing's going to change me and so on and so forth. A little while after that, <laughs> you're not even around. You're not even walking with the Lord. Yeah. Let alone what has Israel got to do with anything? Don't you know that's the problem in the world? Amen. Israel, and don't you know that all the wars are fought over religious matters? Don't you know that? That's the philosophy of the day. So let's forget religion and box out all this stuff. We'll have world peace. Yeah. Don't be surprised if we don't start seeing people putting stuff out about what you believe. I mean, we see a lot of it now, but it's Amen. going to increase more and more. They were willing to give their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any God except their own God. Therefore, I make a decree that every people, every nation, every language which speak anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, uh, shall be cut in pieces and their houses shall be made a dunghill because there is no other God that can deliver after this sort. Then the king promoted. Remember before they were put in position because of Daniel and his favor. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego in the province of Babylon. So now the king is on that high point of the roller coaster again. He's acknowledging God. You can hear all kinds of people acknowledge God. But Nebuchadnezzar was not a servant of God. Nebuchadnezzar, I'll say again, never knew God until he spent seven years of insanity. As the Bible says, like an animal in the field, eating the grass of the field, in the dew, and so on. And then one day, repentance came to him. So through all of this, Listen, no matter who you're around, who you're talking to, love them, tell them the truth of the gospel. They may praise you for a minute. They might bow down and kiss your shoes. You've done me wonderfully. Uh, and then they may walk away and serve and do all kinds of idolatrous things, uh, throw themselves in the world, whatever the case. 
Pray that God will bring them to that place. Amen. Like I said uh, before about praying for these people in high leadership and so on, that they might have a dream or a vision like Daniel or like Nebuchadnezzar had to where it rattled them to the very depths. They couldn't forget about it, even though they couldn't remember what it was. They were troubled by it day and night. This is how our prayer should be. You got loved ones you care about. Pray for them, whether they're running a country or not. What's the difference? Pray for them that way. Cry out to God for them. We're in dangerous times, not like it was a little while back. And so we need the Lord's intervention in all these things. So this morning, I pray you've been ministered to in that. I'm going to stop right there. Um, well, we talked about the Chaldeans. I was going to take you a little further in that, but I'm not. Father, we thank you for this morning, give you the praise, yes, the glory, and the honor. I pray a stirring in every one of us. And Father, as, as age takes some of us, as weariness takes us, I thank you that the spirit doesn't grow tired, doesn't grow weary. And I pray, Holy Spirit, convict us in areas we need to change, in things we need to reapply, in, uh, in other areas where we need to go back and pick up some things that we dropped along the way. I thank you for it and give you the praise this morning. And Father, and for all of us, and myself included, included in all that, for the zeal of the Lord to work in our members. Yes. I thank you this morning. I give you praise, glory, and honor. Listen, if you're out there listening and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you need Jesus Christ to enter into the kingdom of heaven. You need to be born again according to what the Bible says. You may have been in a church like I was, practiced what they did, went through their um, classes and everything. The Bible doesn't say that gets you into heaven. The Bible says you need Jesus Christ Amen. as the Savior and Lord of your life. You need a relationship with him, a personal relationship, which one of the religions right now says you shouldn't even entertain that thought. Others tell you that there's no such thing. Jesus is alive. You see that right there? It says he's risen, and he's risen, and he's alive, and he's coming again. And before he does, there's going to be terrible times on the earth. He said such as never was before. And you and I can be spared from all these things uh, in Jesus Christ and make it into the kingdom of heaven. Ask him to come into your life. Ask him to forgive you of all your sins. If you sit and just name things, God, forgive me of this, forgive me of that. Do it. There's power in that. God waits to forgive. He did all this. He died on the cross in Jesus so that you could have saving grace and make it into the kingdom. This is the best news we can bring to anybody because without him, you cannot see the kingdom of God. And that's what the Bible says. Amen. God bless. Amen.